Welcome to Side Notes. I'm here with the 28th appointed Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, also known as the Vice Regal, the Queen's Representative for the Province of Ontario, David Onley. Thank you sir, so much for your time there, you're David. You're welcome. First question I have to ask is, when you're three years old, you started battling polio. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things that the doctors were saying to your parents at that time anyway? Well, the prognosis back in 1953, when I came down with it in the first instance during the summer of 1953, has been recently documented in a Toronto Star ebook uh, called That Polio Summer. And it was, uh, the situation was grim, not just for myself, but for uh, many people across the province of Ontario, uh, because it was something of an epidemic that was going through. And this was reasonably typical before um, the, so the polio vaccines were developed uh, in the latter part of the 50s. And um, so, you know, the prognosis was, uh, was not good, that, you know, I'd been paralyzed effectively from the neck down, and that there was uh, just sort of modest expectations of uh, having some degree of recovery. So that was a pretty sobering, uh, you know, prognosis that my parents were given. And through extensive physio that you've been able to, you know, gain uh, regular use of your, mm -hmm. your arms and then limited use of your, 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 excuse yes. me, your legs, what were the daily struggles you had to go through, challenges when you were going through the physio you had to face each day? Well, a lot of it is stuff that I don't remember uh, because I was three, uh, three and a half, and uh, the therapy went on for, you know, a number of years. And... I suppose at that point it, it pretty much became part of my lifestyle, so I wasn't even really thinking of it as, uh, oh well, I'm no longer playing, now I have to go and I have to do this, or I have to do that, you know, some other uh, type of therapy. But for a good portion of that time, about an eight-month period, I was first at Sick Kids Hospital um, at the onset of the condition, and then at the uh, what was then called Thistletown uh, Hospital, which was uh, sort of the out in Woodbridge area, and it was the uh, it was kind of the summer, not camp, but it was more of a convalescent uh, hospital as opposed to chronic care. So um, that's where the uh, you know the rehab continued. And you also went to the University of Toronto. You have mm -hmm. a political science degree. What were some of the challenges that you faced on a daily basis going through the school in regards to your your disability uh, accessibility? It's a it's a very good question. Um, the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, or Scarborough College, uh, as it was then called uh, in the uh, 1970s, uh, was one of the most accessible buildings and facilities in terms of higher education in Ontario. And so when I went to visit the campus, um, it really didn't present any physical challenges to me. In fact, it was uh, really a very uh, welcoming place in that regard. I mean, there were uh, elevators and, uh, you know, the classrooms were easy to get to. And uh, at the time, I did not use uh, an electric scooter to get around. I yeah, was uh, uh, more mobile back then in my very early 20s. And um, so it was, a, it was actually a great place to be, uh, not only a, a great education, uh, but also a place that really didn't present challenges. Those came afterwards when I finished my undergraduate program and wanted to pursue a degree, a master's program at the U of T downtown here, just adjacent to the Queen's Park buildings, and came to the sobering realization that, well, Scarborough College was very accessible. Uh, the downtown campus, the St. George campus, was very inaccessible. And so I had to quit the program after a couple of months because it was just simply too hard to get around. So uh, that was the first time I would say um, in that postgraduate phase, that was the first time that I was really confronted uh, with an accessibility issue and that really changed the direction of my life because at the time I was thinking that I would get a master's, then possibly a PhD, and that I would teach political science. Um, ironically, now that I'm getting closer and closer to leaving office sometime later this winter or early spring. Um, that's one of the things I'm thinking about going back and doing is uh, actually beginning a career in, in teaching at the university level. And you took some time off after you graduated. Uh, you wrote a book, 
Uh, mm -hmm. The novel that you wrote was called uh, When Shuttle, Shuttle. Uh, a shattering uh, novel of a disaster. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about the book and afterwards what came out of it? Sure. Um, well, I mean, when I finished uh, my education at the University of Toronto, I considered uh, law school and was accepted at the University of Windsor, uh, which is an excellent law school and also one that was very accessible and uh, much more accessible than many of the other ones. I'd also been accepted at Queen's Law School and went down, was actually registered to uh, attend classes. But as I confronted the degree of inaccessibility, I had to regrettably uh, back away and quit the program at, uh, at Queen's. So that was like the second time in, in two years that I was confronted by um, physical limitations of the, of the inaccessibility of the facility, which then led me to consider Windsor, which somewhat like Scarborough College was very accessible. So um, I pursued law for one year, but quickly realized that was not my calling. I was really not meant to be. Uh, my late father was a lawyer and my middle son, Robert, has become a lawyer recently, uh, but it wasn't for me. So um, when I finished, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I did have an idea about a book on the space program. This was in 1977, and it was some um, three years before the space shuttle was scheduled to go up. And so um, I always felt that I had a strong writing ability, and uh, so I had a plot, and I consulted a number of uh, space program experts and showed them the plot, and uh, they deemed it to be reasonable uh, and uh, it wasn't you know crazy science fiction it was uh, it was science fact uh, moved on into fiction and so that became my project really for about two and a half years and it was the publication of that book shuttle uh, in 1981 and its success that led directly to a position at city tv you, you also have an interesting story that involved the conversation you had with your mother when the co-founder slash former uh, CEO of uh, City TV, mm -hmm. uh, Moses, I think his last name is Zammer. Zammer. When he approached you and uh, for offered you the position, could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, it was quite something because a friend of mine who has since gone on to have uh, an enormously successful career in television in the United States, he too was just starting his career at that point and we had developed a program idea for a weekly space report that we thought would be perfect for City TV, knowing uh, the interest that Moses Neimer had in space. And uh, so we submitted it to him. And I was working at a small little radio station at the time and um, got a phone call from Moses' office late on a Friday afternoon in late November, 84. And uh, the question from the uh, secretary was, could I come in that afternoon to talk to him? And I thought it was about this proposal that we had submitted, when in point of fact, it wasn't. Uh, he wanted to offer me the position of weatherman for City Pulse News. And uh, he was aware of my interest and capability in space, and he said I could do as many space stories as I wanted, uh, but he offered me the position of weatherman. My wife was away on business uh, down in uh, Nova Scotia at that point, and it was all before cell phones, and you just couldn't just quickly grab a hold of people. So I called my mother uh, and said to her, you know, here's this offer that has come along. And she said, well, this is very exciting, and, and, you, know, and you should accept it. And I said, well, I'm not sure if I should, because I, I don't know if he's offering me this position um, because I have the talent or because he sees me as a person with a disability and he just wants to have another minority person, if you will, on the station. Now, take it back, you know, um, almost 30 years, if you will, to that time frame. And back then, Moses Neimer and City TV, it was the, the one station where there were multiple minority groups on air. Uh, all people of different races and colors and uh, creeds. And uh, so that, to me, was a legitimate question that I wondered about. But her response was, well, you've been turned down for enough positions because of your disability. 
even if that is the case, you should probably accept it. And of course I did. And uh, the reality was, as uh, Moses said in subsequent interviews, uh, that he had actually wanted to hire somebody with a disability to be more representative, uh, but he hadn't done that because he hadn't seen anyone who he thought had the ability to do the job. So the, the first criterion was ability to do the job. So um, that's a, an interesting footnote to the beginnings of my career. And you also went on to be the, uh, the anchor, news anchor for a Breakfast TV, mm -hmm. um, 89 to 95. But you were also one of uh, Canada's first visible, excuse me, individuals to have a um, disability, limited uh, visible disability yes. as an on-air personality. Mm -hmm. What do you feel since then, how much further do you feel that uh, the media slash Hollywood has gone in regards to allowing individuals who have visible uh, disabilities, you know, well, exposure? It's a really good question. And sadly, I would say that Hollywood has done a better job than television. Uh, and when I say television, I mean television news and, and in Canada. Um, you know, we, we've reached the point where Michael J. Fox uh, notwithstanding having Parkinson's, can be a character in a major Hollywood TV show where he plays a person who just happens to have Parkinson's. And, um, you know, when you see the different programs like CSI, uh, they regularly integrate people with disabilities as characters in the drama not because there's any specific reason. There's not a, some key element to the plot that, uh, uh, you know, a clue on the ground. Oh, look, there's uh, the markings of a crutch tip. You know, that must be someone using a cane. It's, that's not the point, because they don't do that. But they just, if you watch the show carefully, you'll see that uh, just here and there, um, there are characters that just happen to be in a wheelchair or just happen to be uh, using some sort of an assistive device. And uh, that's just part of the social fabric. It's no more significant in that sense uh, than uh, the person being, you know, Asian or being black or, or being Nordic or, or, or whatever. So, you know, Jerry Bruckheimer in that regard uh, is, you know, I, I regard him as one of the quiet heroes in the, um, in the process of inclusion. Uh, just representing on his shows what we see in, in daily life. Regrettably, in the greater Toronto area, and frankly, nationally, there just aren't that many people, if any at, at all, who are on-air personalities who just happen to have a disability. The question really be, is, is, that a, is it a chicken and an egg situation? Is it students with disabilities not going to radio, television, arts because they don't see them on the air? Uh, or is it uh, radio and TV stations not seeing them come out and therefore they're not, they're not looking for them or not hiring them? So it's a, it's a bit of a conundrum, but it is something that when I started in the fall of the December of 84, um, you know, and, and then really got underway in the very early part of 1985, if somebody had told me that some 30 years later, thereabouts, uh, there would be no additional people, uh, not one, in the greater Toronto area. I, I wouldn't have believed it. So there's a way to go. Um, and, and we also see, I would still see, say there are truly negative stereotypes that are still being projected by the media, uh, specifically Hollywood, on the dark side of Hollywood if, you, Hollywood, if you will. And I would say specifically Toy Story 3. Um, I always uh, found that uh, deeply offensive uh, that Pixar would create the, the evil character um, as being the one that's disabled. Uh, and, and there's just this very dark undertone that the person is evil because of some negative aspect of, of being disabled, that it's scarred them or just you know, scorched their personality. And there's no reasonable explanation in the movie at all. It's just, uh, you know, what you would see from the movies in the 30s and the 40s or the, uh, where they, you know, the bad person was the disabled person. And um, so uh, I found that very disappointing. Um, so there's progress that have been made, that has been made in, in Hollywood and setbacks in, in Hollywood. 
So um, we'll see what the future unfolds. And you were appointed uh, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario in 2007. Mm -hmm. At that time, you were the first ever appointed uh, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario to have a visible disability. Right. And there's 1.5 people in Ontario living with vis visible disabilities. Uh, I just wanted to add that quickly. So there is a large population. It's getting so. closer to 2 million at this point. It's, it's well over 1.8 and uh, closing on 2. And that's projected to be there really before the end of the decade. How much further do you feel that Ontario has to go in order to make it more accessible for people that, have, you know, I, I feel that everyone, we're all able. So for everyone to go for their dream, they need accessibility. Mm -hmm. How much further Ontario has to go to, to achieve that? It's a very good question, and it's not easily answered. Uh, on the very positive side, we're approaching the halfway mark of the 20-year implementation phase of the uh, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act. It was introduced in 2005 and with a 20-year implementation phase. So at the time, uh, a year and a half or so from now, that the uh, Para Pan Am Games take place here in Ontario, uh, and Toronto specifically, will be at the halfway point. So uh, in many areas, we've made very significant progress um, in, because of the act. It was an act that was supported unanimously by all members of the legislature, which is very, very unusual. Uh, it's very rare. Um, but the, the downside is that the employment situation is still bad as it pertains to people with disabilities. At the uh, height of the Great Depression in the 30s, unemployment was at 24%. And that was considered to be a national economic disaster. Uh, for people with disabilities who are adults today in Ontario, and, and the number pretty much applies to the rest of Canada, it's over that. It's like 25%. And that doesn't include people who are working part-time because that's the only position they can get or have had to create their own jobs of self-employment because that's the only job you can, they can get and have no benefits. And when you include that, it increases to something in the order of over 45% of the disabled adult population are either unemployed or underemployed. So for such people, uh, it's not a matter of there being a Great Depression. It's a matter of there being a perpetual depression. It just doesn't end. Those, are no, those numbers have really not changed. The irony uh, is that this is a time when business will tell you that there's a labor shortage. And, and government will say it's, there's a labor shortage. While at, and in some areas, that's true, there are, but only in some areas. Because while there is this perception of a labor shortage, there is in fact 795,000 Canadians living on government assistance right now who are capable of work and who want to work but are living on government assistance. And this, these were numbers that were uh, reported by the Rethinking Disability project paper that was uh, commissioned by the Minister of Finance, Jim Flaherty, in the April 2012 budget. And the committee brought its report out in late 2012 and basically spent uh, early part, I should say, of 2013 and spent the balance of that year and continues to go around the country talking about their results. Because the 795,000, while that's a staggering number, um, it's it's only part of the story. Uh, of the 795,000, 340,000 are recent community college and university graduates who, again, are able to work, want to work, and are now, and now have been trained to work, and yet they're living on government assistance. Plus they're carrying a mass of student loans at the same time. Exactly, absolutely correct. It's a very good point. Um, and so this is a terrible disconnect. Uh, and it, it really is incumbent upon government and the private sec sector to look at this myth of the labor shortage. And there is no labor shortage per se. What there is is an awareness shortage of the availability of skilled and trained people who are ready to work. Um, I think as well there's a, there's a lack of knowledge on the part of government and the, uh, excuse me, of business as to where to go to find these people. And uh, of course, that requires some digging, but there are all sorts of organizations in our society, what some, some of whom I met just this afternoon, the Connect for Life group, uh, linkup.ca, joininfo.ca, 
the March of Dimes. I mean, there's a, there are many social agencies where they're trying to help people with disabilities connect with the workforce and become gainfully employed. Now, the reason it's important for government, especially, is that each person that's on government assistance, especially ODSP, is looking at only getting some $14,000 a year. Well, that's a state of poverty, no matter how you cut it. Uh, if that person, but uh, each of us as taxpayers are providing that money for those people. And we have a social contract in this, in this province and this country. We long ago reached the decision that we would not let people just starve to death on the streets um, that we would provide for the, the least amongst our society. Um, and yet, having said that, uh, here are these folks that are being kept in a state of poverty. Well, government and business are wringing their hands saying that they don't have enough qualified workers. But if you took even a fraction of that 340,000 group and employed them, just uh, sought them out and hired them, they would be off government assistance and they would become taxpayers. And the, the impact on our culture, the impact on our economy would just be absolutely staggering. So it's uh, sooner or later, some jurisdiction is going to figure this out, whether it's Ontario or whether it's Manitoba or whether it's British Columbia or the state of New York, uh, the state of California, I don't know. But sooner or later, somebody's going to figure it out and they're going to reap the benefits of it for their economy. Well, I hope it's very soon because, again, you know, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. I, I feel that we're all able. Some of the awards that you've actually won over the years, I know the Terry Fox Hall mm -hmm. of Fame, uh, the Scarborough Walk of Fame, there's many others. Do you want to share some, at the same time, share the foundations that you've actually have recognized you for your accomplishments? Well, um, I'm a little reluctant, only in the sense that, you know, you can find that information on kind of just by Googling my name, but what I would say is that I'm, I'm most pleased that a number of the organizations that have been very kind enough to present me with awards are organizations that I'm very glad to support. Uh, the Canadian Foundation for Physically Disabled Persons is one. Uh, the Mookie Baum Association is another. Uh, the Ontario March of Dimes is another one. Uh, Variety Village is uh, a great organization. And, and there have been many more over the years that, that I have supported. And uh, it, it always is important to remember that one of the reasons we have such a great uh, culture here in the province of Ontario and why Canada is such a great country to live in is because notwithstanding all of the issues, that, the problems that you and I have been discussing over the last few minutes, it's still a remarkable place in terms of people who are volunteers who are searching out problems and are spending their own time, their own energy, uh, to seek to improve the lot of life, uh, the lot of life for many other people. And so uh, those are just some of the organizations that I'm really pleased to be a part of. Well, you actually went back to acting too at the same time. Yes. Uh, Murdoch Mysteries, yes. you've done a guest appearance on, you've done a guest appearance on other shows too. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know the reason why I want to ask you that question is because you're a massive inspiration to people. People can't use excuses anymore when they see yeah. an individual <laughs> like yourself. Well, I've been very fortunate. I've been very blessed to have uh, opportunities. Uh, I've also been very determined um, to do things. Uh, you know, I have thought about that, that when I was stopped in terms of education uh, at the um, postgraduate level and stopped again in terms of uh, an inaccessible law school. Um, I wrote a novel. Uh, well, that's not a small undertaking. Uh, but I wanted to, and, and it's important to go back to that point, because at that time I could not get a job. So I, I ended up, yes, I wrote a best-selling novel, and I'm very proud of that, and it won a, a couple of awards. But uh, I only wrote it to try to make money because I couldn't get a job in the early 1980s. And I lucked into a position at CKO Radio. But that job only existed because there was a government program that paid for half of my salary. And so, you know, I think of the twists and the turns that uh, led me to get to that position. Uh, you know, not being able to get a job prompted me to 
write a novel. Well, who just sits down and writes a novel as a source of income? Supportive parents in that particular case. They enabled me to, to do that because it took more than two years to do so. Um, it took a, <clears throat> a, a very uh, enlightened gentleman uh, with a firm by the name of Boston Gilbert Henry that uh, used to be a consulting firm that uh, hired me as a research assistant uh, while I was writing the, the shuttle novel and I, I couldn't have completed it had I not had a part-time job there. They were very enlightened people and interestingly enough were doing a study on disability for the Ministry of Health. Um, but that then led to the novel's success, led to uh, someone from CKL Radio learning about me and offering me a position and it was seeing me on or hearing me on CKO that led Moses to uh, offer me the position at City TV, which led directly 22 and a half years later to becoming Lieutenant Governor. So the final thing I wanted to ask you about, I noticed when I walked in here, these, there's a collection of photos from celebrities from the past and even right now. Mm -hmm. uh, what's going on right now? Can you talk a little bit about that? I think Certainly. it's called About Face. About Face, yes. And it's an exhibit of Ontario then and now and it goes back to the earliest, they're all photographs uh, with a couple of exceptions with paintings but the vast majority of photographs and we go back to the earliest photographs that we can find of famous Ontarians uh, including Alexander Graham Bell as just about being the oldest and uh, right up to the the newest if you will in terms of celebrity status of uh, Justin Bieber and uh, Drake and uh, Nazem Kadri and uh, just about everybody in between, including uh, Mike Holmes and Jim Carrey. Um, and it, it's quite interesting as you look at the different photographs, you see the changing demographics of Ontario. Uh, but what you uh, also are reminded as to how many of these famous people are not only Canadian, but from Ontario. And what, who are your, uh, one of the last questions I want to ask you is, who's your five famous people in these photos that you really admire, that you get gain inspiration oh, yourself from? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, my favorite photo overall, I'll, I'll save to the very end, um, I, I like the, the picture of uh, Mike Holmes. I think he's a, he's a fine man and he does a, a lot of great uh, work. There's a very striking image of a lady by the name of Kim Phuc, who's from Vietnam. And many people wouldn't know her by name but if I said to you, uh, the picture from the Vietnam War of the little girl who was running naked after being hit with napalm and being badly burned, uh, everyone recognizes that famous picture from that era. And she since moved to Canada and has successfully raised a family and is now a grandmother. Um, but it's a very, very powerful picture. Uh, the other one that would be, would be uh, that I would admire the, the person, the individuals, Chris Hadfield. Uh, he's quite a remarkable uh, individual to say the least, has accomplished a, a great deal. Um, the, the sort of the fourth one, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure. There's, there, there are a lot of really good ones in there. Um, uh, Robertson Davies is there, uh, Glenn Gould is there, Oscar Peterson is there. Uh, uh, but my favorite uh, is Russ Jackson, the last great Canadian quarterback of the Canadian Football League. And it's a picture taken just about a year before his retirement. And um, his nose is bloodied and his helmet has been scuffed. And uh, he's just gritting his teeth, literally gritting his teeth. And it just, it just captures the essence of uh, football, of uh, uh, leadership, and uh, just the just the, the raw power uh, that uh, goes into the game of football. So that one's my favorite. Well, thank you so much for your time there, Your Honor. Reg, it's been an actual, actual, actual pleasure, really, and I've been, enjoyed it very, very much, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you.